Once a month, my supporters of this show and myself and a special guest have a Zoom meeting. It's not recorded, it's not posted, it's just private. It's between you guys, the guest, and myself. I do this because it means a lot for you guys who support me by showing me that this show means a lot to you. I love talking with you. I look at it as like a benefit for people that support the show, but it's really a benefit for me. I get to know you guys and have an off the record discussion with our guest and, you know, sometimes topics you don't want to necessarily have all the ins and outs discussed online, if you know what I mean. So to be in this group, please go to patreon.com slash counterflow and donate $5 or more per month. And it gets you in this club. We do it once a month. It's a great time. It's great people. They're all smarter than me. So that's an upgrade from what you're used to. I can tell you that. The guests are always guests that people want to hear from. A lot of you guys will be familiar with many of the guests. Father Turbo's done it. Father Deacon Ananias has done it. David Patrick Carey has done it. My own priest, Father Ignatius, has done it. Father Moses McPherson has done it. It's a very good time. And I think you guys would enjoy it if you love this content please go to patreon.com slash counterflow, $5 or more per month. Thank you. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, collide on the hologram graph, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again. This is the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of the ever so warm, sunny summertime, Lockhart, Texas. Good to have you guys with us here this week. I got some friends with me this week, personal friends. Matt Erickson of the King Pilled Podcast and Jason Marinchunk of the Two Bit Podcast. They both have all of these other projects going on. We're going to discuss early on what all they're doing. It's a lot. I don't know how Matt nor Jason have the time in the day, the week, the month, and so on to do as much content as they do. But uh, it's a lot and it's very good. We're going to combine some things they've both been hitting on on their own shows This will combine spirituality, Christianity, orthodoxy with how it manifests through politics, the changing tides that are happening as we speak right now. I assume you guys feel the kind of shifts, the winds of change that are happening leading up to this big election in November. The spirit of the age, we are in the midst of a change from the devouring mother to the vengeful son, the positives, the negatives, the things to look for during this change, what things represent it, the PayPal mafia that Matt's going to get into, the counter elite forming, how Orthodox Christians should approach a lot of this stuff. This is a very good conversation. Both of these gentlemen are very deep thinkers, nuanced thinkers, very intelligent. I think you're going to get a lot out of this as I always do anytime I listen to either one of them. Without further ado, let's bring them in now. My personal friends, Jason Marinchuk, Matt Erickson, my friends, welcome to the show, guys. How are y'all? Good. How are you, man? Great, Jason. Better now that you, better, better now that you were pr- pronounced my last name correct. I did know, it. Just... Yeah. Plenty of practice uh, makes almost perfect. So um, this is kind of fun because usually it's just a one-on-one thing. And now it's it's a threesome of sorts. And it feels like, you know, I have had beers in a bar with Matt. And I feel like at some point I will with Jason. So this is what it's going to feel like, just a casual chat amongst pals. <clears throat> Matt, are you talk- you're all talked out. I don't know how you do this. We'll start with that, actually. I'll let Matt go first, then Jason, give a quick intro. And you guys both have a lot of new content and, and projects in your arsenal, so advertise that if you'd like, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm Matt from King Pilled, at Real King Pilled on Twitter, and uh, then King Pilled on YouTube. And this last... I'm just finishing up my second week now of a new show we just started called The Astrolabe. And it's a morning stream that I do every day, 10 a.m., approximately 10 a.m. Central, go for about two hours. And I'm looking at funny tweets, interesting tweets, uh, different threads, different news news articles, and some YouTube videos and stuff. So it's some entertainment and some inspiration and some, uh, I guess, news analysis. And uh, been having a good time getting getting a good response from it. So uh, you can subscribe on YouTube to to catch that every morning, Monday to Friday, or 
or uh, then and that's just a YouTube show. And then you got the Kingfield podcast and all the podcatchers. I call it mornings with Matt uh, myself because wake up, get dressed, do all the things, have coffee, and there's I turn on YouTube and there you are. <laughs> Jason, go ahead, my friend. Hi, my name is Jason Marinchuk. I am the creator and co. I'm sorry, creator and host. I was going to say co-host. Uh, Used to the two, yeah, of the Two Bit Podcast. Uh, two Bit Podcast is the name of the channel. We have two shows running right now. One is at the end of the day, uh, which is an interview show, uh, or you know, I should say, interview dialogue show, and uh, Meet the Based, which is a panel show uh, that we do weekly. And there's still. Uh, Friend or Fed, which is a uh, sort of a pay per view kind of kind of kind of show um, that I haven't done in a while, but we'll do it again sometime soon. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, some I wanted to get you both on because there's some crossover and things that we all three talk about. Um, and I again, it's just going to be like a chat anyway. It's not like some official interview where you each wrote a book or something. But some of the things you guys talk about, I I call like winds of chains or some shifts that are happening. And it's funny because sometimes I think maybe I'm stuck in this online world or something. And then you start to see whispers of some of the stuff that we all talk about amongst what you might call normies. I don't mean that as a derogatory term, but just kind of regular folks that have lives other than the internet or online and, and, uh, and streaming. Losers. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But you do hear little whispers and it's like, okay, some of this stuff is making waves. It's like the butterfly effect or whatnot. But um, I'll, I want to start with you, Jason, because this spiritual shift uh, is part of it. And then it manifests itself in some of the ways I want to ask Matt about. But discuss the devouring mother and, and vengeful son stuff and where we're at within that paradigm and, and kind of what they mean. Okay. So yeah, we talked about this thing on your show once before, yep. but so we don't have to devour um, sorry, it, no pun, but yeah. We don't have to devour it or smother it. Um, so this is part part Jungian, part um, Pajot, part Girardian. Um, what I, I, I listened to a, a, a P. Canona show to P. Canona's and a Paul Fahrenheit conversation. I think they had two in 2023, talking about the spirit of the age. And part, and part of that conversation was like, wondering what the new spirit, what this incoming age will be. And I started thinking about it and I started thinking about it directly in terms of, um, of archetypes. And what I would say would, would be that you have this, so the spirit of the revolutionary spirit that was going through the 18th and 19th century ran ground in a, a basically 1848 thereabouts. Um, and it ran ground in Europe. So it had taken over, obviously, America, Britain, Haiti, France. And then it got stopped short in Italy, Germany, and a few other places. Oddly enough, if you look at, the, look at World War I, think about who was on the, the bad guy right. side. Right. Um, and it was the anti-revolutionary uh, anti uh, uh, groups. So it runs, runs ground and it starts to shift. And I think it shifts into what I'm calling the tyrannical father. Now, to understand this in sort of a Jungian term, you have, let's say, the, the, the positive and the shadow. So the positive and the negative. And, the, and these two things are, are reflective. So the, the wise father, right, would be the positive. The shadow of the wise father is, is the tyrannical father. And the tyrannical father, I, I've used the image of... Um, I think Saturn uh, in the Roman tradition, uh, there's other there other versions of this where he's eating his children, right? Where he's he's essentially stopping them from realizing their true potential and power because it's, he believes that he, they, they are a threat to him. Uh, and taking that masculine, uh, uber-masculine role, which you normally attribute to the father, and corrupting it. And this is, you know, so when we talk about toxic masculinity, that's where that is, right? And you think of that spirit being the spirit of the early 20th century all the way up to about 1950s. Then it begins to morph and change into the devouring mother. Now, this is one, this one archetype. I've, I've, you know, Cyprian's talked about this. A lot of other people talk about this. So I think this one people are more familiar with. It's probably why people gravitate towards it more. It's also yeah. closer to us. And we right? were still we, living we were, through it. 
to an yeah, extent. We're yeah. products of it. We're products of the devouring mother. Uh, and what's the devouring mother? Well, it's the, inver- it's the inversion or the shadow of the, the divine mother. So we can think of all the, all the good aspects of the mother. Well, what if we invert this into, into the perpetual victim who's always seeking blame, uh, who, is, who wants to protect her children so much she'll kill them rather than have harm. And she's a reaction to the tyrannical father. What have we raised our entire lives with? This idea that women are being beaten and treated unfairly and maligned, which was true to a great degree. There's always truth here. That's the other thing we have to grapple with. Yeah. When I was growing up, you always hear like, there's no, no good reason to hit a woman, right? And, and women's shelters and all that stuff. That arose because a lot of men were beating the crap out of their wives. I, I grew up in European neighborhoods. I grew up in a, in a, in a Greek neighborhood when I was a kid. There was lots of, lots of mothers who I would see, you know, my, around my mother, my mom's age, who'd you know, come in for coffee with a black eye. Mm-hmm. But I, happened, I fell down the stairs again. Mm. Wow. Right? Right. So these things were true. These things come from a true place. It's that they, but they become all consuming. And this is the problem. This is the danger. So, you have the tyrannical father of the of the early 20th century, leading to the devouring mother of the mid 20th century up until let's say around 2020. Now I'm saying that the offspring of these two of these two spirits, and you can think of this as actual spiritual beings, egregores, uh, a zeitgeist, uh, a vibe, whatever you want, however you want to put it down. Veltenschun, Veltenschun, um, yeah, is. So the offspring of these two of these two spirits of these two ages will be the vengeful son, and this is someone who's who's coming up, and this is like this is Oedipus, this is uh, someone made the, made a connection uh, the Doors song. This is the end. Yes, where he kills his father and rapes his yep. mother. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, this is the this is the son who now becomes aware of the betrayal. Is what I've written about is that this is a, a, an awareness of a generational betrayal, an awareness of the, the world you're, you're raised in, which and all the promises you're given were lies. And now, how do you react? And the reaction is violence, and it's a total violence. So it won't just be kinetic, although there'll be plenty of that too. It's cross the board. So I bring up the idea of, of game stonks. Tell people uh, what that is. The, that, that's a very online term, but just so people understand. In about 2020, 2021, there was, a, there was, there was an online um, trading uh, app called Robinhood that these, a lot of add-ons use to essentially figure out that... Um, I won't get into the whole thing because it's, it's complicated, right, but right. essentially there's a, there was a, there was a mechanism, a legal mechanism for, for traders to, to, short a, to short a stock or a company basically betting that that company's going to go under. And then they, they, they make sure that company goes under. And when the company goes under, they make their money back, right? It's complicated. Um, what the GameStonk guys figured out is that they were, they, these guys were doing this to GameStonk, to GameStop, sorry, and to AMC Theaters and a few other companies. And they started to short the shorters. And what this ended up doing was bleeding out the hedge funds that were, that were, that were supporting the short. Right. Again, anyone who's interested in it, I've done shows about this. You can go look at this online. I, I, I'm not, not well versed enough as to condense it all into, a, into an easy package. But the, the point of this all is, is that during that period when this was going on, uh, someone went to one of the guys, one of the lead guys who was doing this, who was, short of the, who was shorting the shorters, and, tell, and said to him, like, look, if you keep holding these stonks, it's because there's a big outcry, hold the stonks, hold them, right? Don't sell them, hold mm-hmm. them, bleed them. But essentially, the longer we hold these things, the more we bleed the hedge funds. And we, and we put these guys out of business. And they basically did. And one of the uh, reporters talked to him and said, you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to lose all your money, right? Like, you understand, like, you'll lose all your gains. It doesn't matter. That's not what, that, yeah, that's, no, I'm, not, I'm not here for the money. I'm here because those guys hurt my dad back in 2008. I'm going to hurt them now. That's vengeful son. That's what I'm saying about total violence. That energy. Elon Musk telling uh, Disney and all those guys to go F themselves. Because it's like, what, you're threatening me with money? Are you stupid? Like, come at me. Come at me, bro. That's vengeful son. I just, I, I mean, my DMs are full of this. 
of people uh, sending me clips. There was one now in a Twitter space with that girl, Lily. I don't know if she's making the, she's a the DR girl of the, of the week. And uh, there was a guy just dressing her down saying, what are you doing? Like you're, you're, you're a single mother and you went to Detroit to get high and, and get laid. What, what are you doing? Why are you being a bad mother? Like this is vengeful son. This is like awareness of something and telling, tell, telling people to go F themselves. Mm. Like, but you take that energy, which in and of itself is not a big deal, but you extrapolate it out and you start to see how this could become a big problem. And Buck, you know, what I was saying to be before we started recording is that my fear, there's two fears. One, that it's going to feel good. And this is the thing that we have to war, warn against. And I'll take this over to Matt because I don't take, take over the whole <laughs> show. I'll, I'll, I, w- I will if you let me. But um, we'll talk about the prodigal son because I, I think we can wrap this up, up into it. But one of the problems with the conventional son is it's going to feel good. It's going to feel righteous. And as if you become consumed by it, you'll be consumed by violence. Mm. And this is the thing we have to warn against. And my biggest fear is that if they do what they did before and you know, fortify that election, and now 85 million people vote for Biden, there will be blood. And yes. the kind that when we get into memetics and a whole bunch of other things will be unstoppable. To, to the to the degree that we are not prepared to deal with, and that's that's my fear. So, you know, we'll we'll make our prayers, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, get ready for it, because uh, November is going to be very decisive one way or another. Um, anyways, it's not, and that's not black pill. It's just, it's just, it's just a, the is is the is, and uh, something to to be aware of. Guys, something really, really sad and bad happened and some people need our help in the Orthodox community. You probably saw this online or on the news. I saw a few news reports actually and it really was more impactful there. St. Theodosius Russian Orthodox Cathedral has suffered a devastating fire and needs our help. It was originally founded in 1896 with financial assistance from none other than St. Tsar Nicholas II's Russian Missionary Fund. St. Theodosius is the mother church for all Orthodox Christians in Ohio. The cathedral itself was built and consecrated in the early 1910s and for over a hundred years has been a beacon of light to Northeast Ohio. Its distinctive onion domes, which we love, have been a staple of the Cleveland skyline for generations. It's even been in movies, which I saw this on the news report too, most notably the 1978 epic picture, The Deer Hunter, starring Robert De Niro and Christopher Walken. Tragically, on Tuesday, May 28th, a fire broke out while a restoration crew was working on the cathedral. While no one was hurt, it nevertheless has left severe damage to the main dome and much of the inside of the church. As you guys know, I'm a firefighter, so I'm very well aware of just fires in a small part of a building, the smoke damage, the water damage that happens. A lot can happen, even if the fire ends up being somewhat minor. The damages are estimated at over $1 million. In a wonderful touch of divine providence, the lampada hanging in the altar in front of the icon of Christ's resurrection never went out, despite all of the water that the fire department used. I can tell you guys, it's thousands of gallons of water. Isn't this amazing? All of the wind that was in there, the flying debris around as they put out the fire, truly a beautiful bit of consolation from our Lord Jesus Christ to the faithful at St. Theodosius. Now our brothers and sisters at St. Theodosius need our help. If you are able to donate, please visit www.stTheodosius.org Fire Restoration. That's S-T-T-H-E-O-D-O-S-I-U-S dot org slash fire restoration and help them out. And if you can't help monetarily, please pray for them and keep them in your prayers in this time of need. Thank you all and God bless. Matt, I don't want to form what you're about to say because you're you're great on your own, so I'll let you take it from here. But I do want you to include some of the PayPal mafia stuff and how that relates into where things are headed. Hmm. So a lot of these are ideas that you've had. Um, Jason's had his, 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 it's like he's thinking in this domain and I'm thinking in this domain. And then we we're bouncing ideas off of each other and, and, and building each other up. <laughs> and one of the things that I um, spent a lot of time thinking about was this idea of resentment. And how much you, this is like the resentment is like the, 
the characteristic emotion of the vengeful son. It's, it's the, the, the driving force of the vengeful son. He, he resents his father for not being there for him. He, um, his father was away building businesses or um, completely absent, in prison, uh, dead, whatever. The vengeful son is a, is, a guy, is a guy who grew up, speaking archetypal terms, he's a guy who grew up with being raised by women. His father wasn't there. And he resents his father. And he also resents his mother for, for the being the devouring mother. Another term for devouring mother that works well is, is smothering mother. She's smothered him. She's, she's helicopter parented him. She's basically, cr- she's trying to protect him so much, she's crushing the life out of him. And he's finally breaking free of all of this. But he, so he's got all this rage and resentment and hatred build up, built up. But he's also really naive and, 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 and immature and doesn't understand how the world works. So this just turns into basically a chimp out. And he, this is all born out of resentment. And it, and it occurred to me, I realized this is the same phenomenon. I'm watching a lot of young men on the internet. And a lot of people, the, the worst thing is the people who are catering to these young men and trying to foment this sentiment in them, which is that you're a victim. You have all of these institutions, like, look, look what they've taken from us. Look what they've done to us. Whether it's this enemy or that enemy, you each have, we each have our pet um, uh, boogeyman that we want to, it's like pin the tail on the boogeyman. And, but they're using all of the same language that, you know, so now it's like, it's the Jews instead of the state for libertarians. For, um, for the, the capitalists, it's the communists. For the communists, it's the capitalists. Uh, it's, it, there's there's a, a boogeyman and this manifestation of this spirit is such that it's pick a big, pick a boogeyman, blame him for everything and revolve your life around opposition to him and, and seeking his destruction. And so there's, it could be different boogeyman, but it's the same phenomenon. So this is, many of these young men are libertarians or have been libertarians or were once libertarians or still feel libertarian inclined. But, and they took all of this like, like mental uh, architecture that they built up around opposition to the state and they've just transferred it to a different boogeyman. But now it's ramping up. They're getting more and more hostile. And uh, Dark Enlightenment, a guy that, that Jason just talked to that um, I've heard multiple times on, on Pete's show that I'm going to line up and talk to myself. He mentioned something on Pete's show uh, a couple months ago. He said, I'm pretty convinced that I'm going to wind up dying on the left. And what he meant yes. by that was, was that there's going to be such a strong reaction to everything that's happened that it's going to go so much further in the other direction. It's to, to the point where someone who is like, so right wing now that they can't even be talked about in public conversation to like, they're going to be like, dude, like you guys need to chill out. Like let's pull on the reins here. Let's back it off. And what I see this as is this is not a, it's a reaction to liberalism. And by liberalism, I don't just mean the political philosophy, but like the worldview, the paradigm and everything that's attendant to that materialism and uh, capital S science trademarks, you know, that that whole world, right. This, this modern secular priest class, that whole world, they're, they're reacting to that world, but they're reacting to that world with the tools that world gave them. Yes. Which is that ultimately liberalism is resentment politicized. So you've got all of these guys now, ironically, who see themselves as, as you know, enemies of the libs and, you know, the, we got to exterminate them and get, out, get them out of here. If, you know, um, it didn't happen, but if it, but if it did, it should have and it should happen again. You know, this kind of uh, sentiment. And they're really just becoming the monsters that they, they're, they're seeking to oppose. Yes. They're embodying the spirit of resentment, which is the ultimate essence of liberalism. They're becoming like, like, like peak libs in their desire to, to tear down the lib structures. So the PayPal mafia, now you asked me to, to incorporate yeah. that into this. So as I was starting to think along these lines with Jason and, and on my show on King Pilled with my co-host Cooper, we were looking at the different generations. And, uh, you know, Boomer, Gen X, Millennial, Zoomer. And uh, we've done lots and lots of content about this. You can go look at the channel if you want to see that. I I broke this down a little bit more in a recent interview with Disgrace Propagandist on um, the Carousel podcast. So you can go listen to that as well. But um, most condensed form, basically, the Boomers and the Millennials have a sort of a, a, a mirror. They're kind of mirroring each other. And then Gen X and Zoomers kind of have the same relationship to them as, as well. And the Boomers have are very unique generation in world history. They've overseen, their life lifespan has seen the rise of 
of economic and, and, and political growth, unlike population growth, unlike anything else in world history. And they've kind of ridden this wave up to the top. But then because of the nature of the institutions they rose to the top, they've entrenched themselves there and then stayed there. The last four presidents and the next president. So we're going to have five presidents in a row who are all boomers. I haven't gone through and looked at all of them, but I'm pretty sure that's the only time that's ever been the case where you've had one generation that's produced five presidents. And so eventually part of the, the, the nature of this holding on is that number one, you've got all of the other generations beginning to back up behind them. And the, these systems are becoming more and more rigid and useless. And you've got all these people who dedicated their life, their education, their money, their time, everything to trying to climb these, these hierarchies. And now they're discovering either I'm never going to get to the top of the hierarchy or the hierarchy is not going to exist by the time I get there. So these, these boomers are going to start dying off and they've been at the, at the top for so long that when they die off, it's going to be fast. So there's going to be a rapid adjustment to new people stepping into positions of power who have different priorities and different ways that they see the world. It's not going to be like a hard cut, but there's going to be a distinct shift. So looking at this, I'm like, okay, well, the next generation is Gen X. They're the ones who basically have been kind of deprived of their time in the sun, which as a generational personality, they kind of, many of them don't really care. They're sort <laughs> right. of, they're a little bit orthogonal to the establishment, a little more renegade. And, um, but then, uh, but there are those who do care. Who, these things do matter to them. They haven't had their time in the sun. They want their time in the sun. And they're beginning to recognize we need to start reviving or saving or reforming or doing something with these systems or we're not going to have a human civilization anymore. We're not going to have even a society. So I started looking for those characters and then began to find them very clearly. It became the most, I, I, to, to condense it down because we don't have five hours to talk about this, it's basically pay, playing like three degrees of Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. When you begin looking at the most influential Gen X people who are beginning to make their stamp on the world, this would be the Tucker Carlson's, the uh, Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, um, and, and the whole Bitcoin world, the uh, uh, Nayib Bukele, uh, Javier Malay. These are all, some of them are millennials even, but these are all, they have this more Gen X posture to the world. And they're really just the generation that's coming up to inherit things now. And you're beginning to see this, the fingerprints of Peter Thiel on everything. And I think that the, the it's, it's not that these people are necessarily our friends. It's not that they're low. Like, oh, these guys represent the, the ideal political people or the ideal personalities or anything like that. It's recognizing, number one, this is going to happen. You know, it, it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. So I'm trying to chart out the course ahead of us. And I see them as guys who are coming through the system now and beginning to reform it toward their goals, their agenda. And the act of reforming it toward their agenda, as many of these are like kind of tech libertarian sort of guys, they want to see regulation stripped away and they want to see immigration restricted because they've got heavy economic vested interests in these things happening. So them pursuing their own self-interest actually ends up working out a lot for the rest of us. And they... Um, this is a movement that I, I, we, I first identified it on, on Jason's. Jason was like, this PayPal mafia thing is kind of interesting. You know, is there something there? Is he connected? Are they connected to this Vivek Ramaswamy guy? And I, I, I turned on my autism and just started digging. Mm -hmm. And everything was just like, Peter Thiel this, Peter Thiel that. Every, he's invested in it. He's done business with them. It's a company he's involved with. All of these different things, all these different initiatives. And they're beginning to, like almost with one voice, counter signal the regime, which is pretty significant for a lot of these guys coming out of Silicon Valley. They've like DEI and um, the DEI immigration, China, uh, and the, the waning economic military uh, uh, readiness and um, like, like being on the cutting edge. These are all things that are very, very important to them because they, they're, they're still libs. Like they still are basically libs, but they want to see America exist. They want America to exist because they want to benefit from America existing. So they want America to have sovereignty, to, to not be controlled by foreign governments, to not have these retarded economic schemes being um, uh, like moving numbers around and just impoverishing people and fomenting unrest and all this stuff. They don't want to see that. So they're beginning to start making moves to take control of things. And so we first identified this in Silicon Valley, but then it's become clear since then that there's a much larger movement afoot. You have the Project 2025 group that are angling to be essentially controlling Trump's administration. 
You've got the U.S. investment banking sector that's starting to make a lot of uh, a lot of moves. A lot of your listeners um, have been conditioned very well to be suspicious of the Fed, and I'm very suspicious of the Fed. But I've had to revisit a lot of my priors, watching the way that James, that Jerome Powell has been behaving, yes. and the way that the moves that he and Jamie Dimon particularly are spearheading are affecting Europe, and they're actually. They're, these are nationalist moves as they're trying to retrench manufacturing and um, control over our own money and all these sorts of things. So these are, you could think of it as like a genuine pro-America movement. Mm -hmm. Tom Luongo kind of had some interesting yep. um, thoughts. He was first on my show talking about this and he's like, I know this sounds weird. Imagine if these guys control the Fed that we like in a, in a sense, again, that's not like our cut, you know, cut and dry heroes, but you know, I think that's kind of right. what you're getting at. And Tom Luongo is the guy to listen to. It speaks to the it speaks to the necessity of of updating your programming so so often. Like Friend or Fed, the show that I that I did and I kind of put put the show uh, put the channel on the map. Um, one of the key principal ideas between Friend or uh, 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 Friend or Fed is to question your priors, because so often what we do is we get dug into a narrative, and this is these are always good and these are always bad, and no matter what, you no know, good bad, this is whatever, right? And sometimes you need to re-examine re it to go, okay, look, when I did the Putin friend or fed, you know, I'm a Ukrainian, uh, you know, my fam my, most of my family's Ukrainian, um, or at least my mother's half the other side is, is Ukrainian. Do you think I was a Ukrainian nationalist? Still am to, to, a, great, to, a, great, to a great degree. Do you think I like uh, the idea of having to agree with, with Vladimir Putin? No, of course not. But I have to listen to the man and I have to listen to what's going on and examine it on the ground and go, what is really going on? And if, if the best case scenario for you, for Ukraine existing as a Ukrainian for, for Ukrainians is to be on, uh, under the uh, umbrella of, of Russia, then that's where you have to go because my principle remains the same. And I think what we're seeing quite often in these spaces and, and the bitter white pill or one of the blessed things that's happened, a little bit of grace that's happening in the DR, if you want to call it the dissident right, is that people's tent are actually standing on principle more and more. And I'm starting to see rejection of the grifter. And this, I made a prediction about neotrads. Yes, I want uh, to get as to that too. This will be, this will be the, 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 the way they, they reform the, the woke. Uh, so some people are calling it you know, the woke right or some of that, but I think neotrads is sexier. Uh, I still think that's going to happen. But I'm, I, I have a lot... I, I've been given given much more hope by seeing a lot of people on the DR reject it and and see it happening and go nah 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 no we're you're not invited to the party right this is Meta Prime's message this is a lot of people's message saying no we're not doing that we're not letting uh, Pry the doll in no we're not you know we're not we're not doing this thing if you want to have your little scene and your little group and some of that that's cool but you don't represent us. That's powerful. And that's the kind of differentiation we need. It's, it's also part of my, my prediction is that as the neo-trad thing starts happening, a lot, it'll become normal. It'll normalize things. And the true, and the, the bitter white pill here is that people who are on the outs, they know probably us and a few others, we, we have a window of opportunity to make some money and, 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 get some, and gain some ground. But ultimately, we will be scapegoated harder by those guys than even by the left. Mm -hmm. The left needs us. They don't. We're competition. We will be rivals, right? We're not rivals with the left, right? With the wokists. They, we're, we're the scapegoat. So they actually need us. We fulfill a function. When it, when it swings to neo-trads, when it swings to the right, and the sort of like mush Christianity, all that stuff, Orthodox people and some of that will be now rivalous and they mm. will come after us much harder so T jason can you dig mind. a little can you dig a little further into that it, uh, when charles haywood was on he mentioned something about you know the vast majority of let's say default lefties you know they're just w once there's a a, a major change in, in direction of where things are going. Let's say a counter elite rises, th they're just going to go with with that. It's not like their heels are dug into like pride parades and, and blue hair and whatnot. Just like happened after World War II, and it's and people in Germany are like, I'm a uh, I like liberal democracy now. Uh, can you can you talk about that, Jason? And, and what 
you, you, you know, you post about it all the time. I've sent you things where it's like, wow, this is interesting. Even to a lame extent, Bill Maher will say stuff and you're like, huh, okay, now he sounds kind of like I would have five years ago or something. But talk about that. Real quick, Jason. Yeah. Real quick, just to set that up. You, you, so you've hit on some deep cuts here, Meta Prime and Pry the Doll and some of the stuff. And to those people who are not uh, extremely online, they're not participating in these right. dissident right-wing Twitter circles and everything. Part of the recognition of what's happening with the PayPal mafia and these other adjacent sectors that are beginning to move against the regime is they're saying and doing and beginning to embody a lot of the same patterns that have happened within the dissident right over the last several years. I've been on Twitter for 15 years. And I've watched how, especially over the last probably 10 years, Twitter and the political happenings and the political goings on there have been the leading edge of American culture. This is whether you have an interest in it or not, it has an interest in you. And we're describing what's actually happening there. So some of these things are really like kind of niche little um, way off in the in the in the in the like little uh, niche corners, but they they ripple out. All of these different trends have been rippling out. This was part of what we identified with this PayPal mafia thing is we're like, there's politicians and tech CEOs and stuff that are starting to say the stuff we've been saying yes. for the last three, four, five years. And we're just picking up on people who've been saying it before who, who are even more French. And so, the most, go ahead, Matt. The, so the within most that rec- context, then you have the neo trads um, being something that Jason's identified bubbling up from within these milieus. And the most yeah, recent this, millennial like, example I can think of, pop culture, let's it kind of, is Candace Owens now, who I didn't even pay attention to, to be quite honest. I just thought she was just a, a kind of a generic conservative voice. Now I'm paying attention to her and I'm like, a, a little shocked. I shouldn't be, I suppose. It's like, well, she's paying attention. She's noticing, if you will. Like she's saying things that I didn't think you were allowed to say that I thought we would have been you know, kick from YouTube for. She's modeling Peter Thiel. Okay. okay. How, do, how do we get there? How is Candace Owens modeling Peter Thiel? Let's put that over here. Okay. So point A, we're, we're going we're to get to Neotrads. How are we going to do this? Right on the screen. Okay. This is, this is where we're, we're going to get to. How do we get there? Let's go back to René Girard. Right? René Girard is a French anthropologist uh, who... Uh, who famously created uh, mimetic theory, which rests on this idea that all human desire rests outside of us. So, and in, in an orthodox position, we can understand this as a passions. Uh, Father Trevor Quayles, famously, I think, on your show or someone's show, made this connection. Is that uh, it, essentially what what Girard is is detailing here? Is connected to to the orthodox understanding uh, understanding the passions, but before a muddy good water is too much, right? So all everything we desire is externalized. We need someone to des, to desire it first in, for, for, in order for us to give it to give it value. So let's do a, a simple one, right? Our neighbor buys a new car. Uh, we see the value of the car. We desire that car because our neighbor has it. So and we will, if the car is, is, is very limited, we will enter into rivalry with our neighbor. This is the anti-mimetic trends of, let's say, the commandments. We're saying, like, do not covet your neighbor's stuff is directly to associate this, this kind of this phenomenon where human beings will want what other people want. And this is a foundational aspect of, of mimetic desire and mimesis in general, right? So. I bring this up because Peter Thiel was the student of Girard. He didn't just study under Girard. Uh, he was the student of Girard. Like, he was Girard like had one, was a PhD advisor for one person. Right. Peter Thiel. He was like disciple. Yeah. So he understands mimetic theory and, and, and the, the, the mimetic desire principle better than probably almost anyone else on the planet. Right. I, I'm armchair. You should get Luke Burgess on to talk about this stuff. Uh, but so when you start to understand mimetic theory, you can easily start making very accurate predictions, as I have. Uh, and this is not blowing smoke up my ass. It's just like I'm, I'm telling you how I'm doing it, and anyone can do this. I'm using two, two, two reference points. One is Jonathan Pajot, and one is Rennie Girard. So, so Jonathan Pajot has talked about 
how things come from the outside, right? So the Joker, the 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 uh, the fool, uh, the immaculate fool is always looking at the outside. He's actually the conduit to the outside, to the fringe, and the fringe is always trying to get in, right? It's assaulting the 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 main body of the culture and trying to to leak in now. There should be good filtering events because sometimes things from the outside are valuable. So where we get poetry, where we get yep. intuitions, where you know, if you, in, you, in the Orthodox tradition, we can talk about the noose, right? A clearing the noose and these things come in. These are intuitions, right? These are all from the outside. What else is on the outside is monsters. So you need a good filtering mechanism to keep the monsters out and keep the good intuitions in. And you kind of filter that through, through these mechanisms. Um, so you, I take, taking that from Girard saying, saying, sorry, from Pajot saying, I'm looking to the outside and then applying it with mimesis saying, what is, what is being adapted? What is being desired? And what is, what is being modeled? Because everything about mimesis, mimetics is modeling. I'll give you a better example for, for the parents. Listen to this. Your child models you. They do, Right. You sometimes catch your kid doing doing you better than you, <laughs> and it's not always it's not very not always it's very rarely flattering. Yeah. But when you catch that, it's like there's your modeling, right? That's your kid doing you, performing yeah. you, directly doing what you do. Another good example is like if you give attention to a cabinet, your kid will be drawn to the cabinet. So maybe you're saying I don't. Sometimes your attention is I don't want my kid to go in where the good china is. But you, every time you look at that, your kid's being drawn to that and your kid's giving value statements out of that. If you desire that cabinet, if you're attaching value to it, it must be valuable. Yes. So they're drawn to it. Cyprian's example was right? go stand outside on a public sidewalk and stare up at the sky in amazement and watch how many people come by. What? You know, that kind of thing. Yep. Mimetic values. So now you have Peter Thiel. Okay. Interesting little character. The student of, 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 of René Girard, who understands limitic theory better than anybody else, and how people, and these, and these automatic mechanisms. Uh, also, a, a good, good friend and disciple of Anthony Scalia, uh, the, we'll just say, uh, uh, surprise death, uh, uh, Supreme Justice. Uh, and you, you start to set up this whole interesting backstory of how these things are happening and how these predictive models are, are happening. And what I'm saying is that the, that the neotrad, this whole, what you're going to start seeing is modeled after Peter Thiel, who is Peter Thiel, a sensible gay man, right? Who's the head of a of, of massive uh, uh, VC and, and sort of tech bro kind of uh, connections. To the point where, if you look at the head of Palantir, he, he acts and dresses a lot like Peter Thiel. You look through all the VC bros, their haircuts, when Peter Thiel changes his haircut, they change their haircut. When Peter Thiel dresses down and puts on certain, certain styles, they change their styles. Dude, get down that rabbit hole. You want to get, you want to get completely mind screwed. <laughs> you know, like I, one to one within a month. I'm telling you, right? So you track Peter Thiel, you track thousands, if not millions of people. And what I'm saying, uh, Matt, I'll kick this over to you because you said this on A-Stream, that people, kids are modeling uh, Elon Musk. I think Elon Musk is more the, the front-facing. He actually likes to engage where Peter, Peter doesn't. Right. So Elon is, 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 is interacting more to the point where young boys are wearing I love Elon t-shirts with a rocket. And AA had to admit that. Hey, yeah, I'm seeing that. That's modeling, right? So the like, young kids are modeling Elon, but everyone behind Elon, all the power structure behind Elon, all the investment power structure behind Elon are all modeling who? Peter Thiel. So Peter Thiel doesn't have to be doing all the investing. Peter Thiel is doing two things at once. He's both a model and a moderator. So in Girardian memetics, you can have 
you could, you know, I've, I've, I've either or. So a model is someone that people want to be like, and they try to be like them in as many ways as possible. A moderator is someone who's directing desires. They often use Iago and, and Othello as example of someone who's telling you what to desire. Peter Thiel is both. So everyone who's modeling Peter Thiel is doing things in a way that Peter Thiel would. So Peter Thiel doesn't have to invest in a hundred different companies. Everyone who models Peter Thiel is doing is, is investing in a way that Peter Thiel would. See? So when you read zero to one and you and you pay attention to what Peter Thiel is saying, you suddenly become aware that there's in this this entire VC world is being moved by one guy. That's the PayPal mafia. There's your proof. So when we say things like, I think Peter Thiel's influencing Kelly and, 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 and Mele, and this is a build a Caesar moment, we're right because you can start to see it and it's through modeling. It doesn't have to be Peter Thiel directly doing things, pulling the levers. It's Peter Thiel saying, I like this. And everyone going, I like it too. Because everyone wants to be like him. Elon's not the guy. Elon is a guy. And there's, there's tons of uh, public people who want to be like Elon. But everyone with real power and real money want to be like Peter Thiel. Because Peter Thiel is, is 10 for 10 on, on investments, man. Even his failures are, are, are successes in, in, in their own way. It's, it's stunning. Um, and let me set Matt up with this. And then so th some of these guys, PayPal Mafia, et cetera, maybe disciples, if you will, of, of Peter Thiel. Is this signaling what we would call a counter elite then to somewhat take over? I mean, I think most of my people listening understand like the, the regime as it stands now is crumbling. They're kind of, you know, they're like a caged animal, a very a one that's not well fed at this point and trying to swipe at things and they're skinny and their ribs are showing and they're bleeding and they're just swiping at whatever will they can try to kill and, and take down or put in prison. And where, where, where does this all fit in, Matt? Okay, so I'm going to try to, to synthesize multiple different things here that all came to mind as you guys were talking. So, um, the, so there's the, the masculine-feminine dynamic, which I'll get to that in just a minute. Then there's the, uh, the competency crisis. And, the, and then there's the nature of the regime itself. So the nature of the regime itself and, is... Sorry, and, sorry, yeah. and, you, and you can lay me up to my, to my meta crisis. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I haven't said yet, but... We're, we're, once you see that, once you see it like this, then it unlocks a whole bunch of things altogether. Right, so what, what he's describing, what Jason's describing here, is okay. not necessarily a consciously a conscious thing. It's not that these that all of these different people are like reading books about Peter Thiel and and um, looking up what Peter Thiel is up to and everything. It's that he's he's an an an, an influential figure such that when he moves people naturally, there's a ripple effect of people moving behind him and moving in lockstep with him, whether they're aware of it or not. So the nature of the regime itself right now is a coalition. Like any, any major ruling regime is going to be some sort of coalition, especially in a democratic world and where people were, are, are operating from a democratic premise. So this regime has to maintain this coalition between different groups that have different varying desires um, but it has to thread this needle somehow and keep them invested in it. So for a long time, the different groups have like people identify each of these and try to pick them off as the the group, whether it's the um, the Jews or the communists or um, the uh, uh, like like crypto Nazis or whatever. It, each of these is all true in its own way because there's a regimes and social movements of this size are are much larger than the people who are who make them up. Yes, and they're all a matter of an alignment of incentive. Uh, Tucker Carlson put this best in his conversation on the Sean Ryan show, which is an absolute must watch if you haven't seen it. He said it's conspiracy of interest. Yes, it's that people who grow up in a certain world with certain values doing things a certain way, they don't need to be coerced or or explicitly told to do a certain thing or behave in a certain way. It doesn't have to be coordinated. They will naturally do it. Yes, because this is how people like this behave. 
Yes. And so just to interrupt real quick, yeah. all the people throughout my, the last 20 something years of my life, well, how could there be this group of people and no one else knows about it and they all are controlled by the same, it's like, this is why, this is how conspiracies yes. work. It's like, you don't have to have a room full of six people and that's the only people that know about it. You can have a room full of six people, excuse me, six people, I'm getting fired up. And it extrapolates from there because of these incentives that are laid out. You don't need to tell the guy 10 times down the line, hey, here's what we're doing. You know, so right. sorry to interrupt, but that yes. fires me up. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. These Each of these groups is controlled by the other. They're all controlling each other and there's a constant tug of war for power. And when things are good, they're all willing to compromise with each other to, to get what they want. But as things get worse and worse, eventually members of this regime coalition begin breaking away. And, and the, more that, the, the more members of the coalition who break away, the stronger the pull becomes for others to break away. But then you get into this sort of like prisoner's dilemma kind of situation where everyone is waiting for everyone else to move first. And this is kind of where, how it feels right now. Everything is a kind of, there's sort of a, a, a calm before the storm. And it's kind Cast of like... The, casting the first stone. Yes, yes, exactly. Everyone's waiting for someone else to move. And the regime has spent the last four or five years absolutely blowing every last little bit of political capital that they had. And they'd, they'd built up this political capital by, by borrowing from the future, literally in debt. Whether you're talking financial debt or spiritual debt, they're going deep and deeper in de into debt to accumulate this political capital that then they've spent effectively all at once. Now the curtain is beginning to pull back. And this is because of a whole bunch of different things, the internet and social media and Elon taking over Twitter. And there's a, there's, you could spend hours talking about it. There's so many different reasons why. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we're seeing the Wizard of Oz, the emperor has no clothes, so many different analogies. Everything is being revealed. We're in an age of apocalypse. A great revelation is happening. Yes. And... What's driving much of this is the competency crisis because this regime, so this is going to be the competency crisis bridging into the masculine feminine thing. This regime has built itself on undermining and eliminating competency in the name of pursuing radical egalitarianism. This is what one might call toxic femininity. This is, this is femininity that's been allowed, that's been unconstrained. Women, the feminine spirit wants to be constrained by the masculine spirit. Jason was talking about the um, the what's on the outside of the walls. Like we want this. We need people to go out beyond the walls and explore and expand the horizons and discover new things and creativity, all these sorts of things. Those exist outside the fringes. So we have to mediate between the center and the fringe. The feminine spirit is naturally conservative. It wants strong walls. It wants all the scary stuff out and it wants to be able to nest within its domain. But so the feminine re spirit requires the masculine spirit to establish those walls and then maintain them. And the feminine spirit maintains everything within the walls. So the masculine spirit becomes the mediator between what's inside and what's outside. Romanticism, mediator, versus, romanticism versus pragmatism. Yes. Men are, this is a, a Charles Padilla quote. He said, men are um, romantics masquerading as pragmatics and women are pragmatics masquerading as romantics. Sorry, just, just yes. jump in for two seconds. Entrepreneurs, romantic. Yes. Managers, pragmatic. Yes. You need yep. both. You need both, but they have to be in the rightful place. When one supersedes the other or tries to dominate the other, you have, you have not just uh, uh, rivalry, you have discord, right? Mm -hmm. All rivalry leads to conflict. All conflict before Christ was resolved through a scapegoat. You put the problems on a person, you expel that person, things get better. Because you're, it's, it's, it's Jonas, right? Jo Jonah and the whale, sorry. Uh, you know, we say that, ah, oh, he's the reason why things are bad. We get rid of him, things get better. This is human sacrifice. Why Odin, you know, demanded a sacrifice for fair win. All the rest of it. You killed someone and usually ate them because that was part of the process. Christ breaks it. When Christ breaks the scapegoat mechanism by revealing the, 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 the idea of the perfect victim, that 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 who who he who is sacrificed may not be guilty, which is an idea that never happened before in myth. He breaks myth that way, and by doing that, by doing so, he ushers in Western civilization. Western civilization is built on the idea that an innocent victim can exist. 
Now, what's been perverted is that we all think we're the innocent victim. Yes. Yeah. And we're not. We have to take responsibility. If everyone right. is the innocent victim, no one is. Yep. And so which leads us, which leads us into prodigal son. But sorry, my right, go ahead. right. So you so you have the um this this distortion that's happened between the masculine spirit and the feminine spirit. I've um I've compared this to I've uh, been kind of working on this analogy that masculinity is kind of like an electrical charge and feminine femininity is kind of like the magnetic field. And the magnetic field can only extend as far as the electrical charge goes. If there's a weak electrical charge, the magnetic field will be weak. And there's a there's a there's a polarity here whereas the electrical charge begins to like if you think about this like it's like receding back to the center, the the magnetic field is going to be ahead of it pulling back from it. But then as the electrical charge begins to go out again, the magnetic field is going to follow it. So if you have, we have, there's a, there's back to the resentful young men. There's lots of men who are complaining about the quality of women. Uh, everything's over feminized, the feminization of everything. Yes. That we've lived under the spirit of the, of the devouring, smothering mother. Everything has become feminized. This is because femininity moved in to fill the space that was, that, that was, um, or they actually vacated the space that would have been occupied by healthy femininity because there was no healthy masculinity upholding it and creating the borders for it to, for them to operate with it. And the, the, the function of a woman, like a manager, they, she manages, she's managing her domain. She's the, uh, the man, the man is the vessel and the woman is the water inside that vessel. And if there's a crack in the vessel, the water is going to find it. A woman is like a debugger for the code in men. She's the, she's the, there's a term, the shit test. Women are made to shit test. They're, they're made to um, identify a crisis. And if one isn't there, manufacture one to test the metal of the man. This is how men, men's integrity is built by women constantly shit testing them and, and having them prove their competence. So now we have a feminized structure masquerading as, as leaders, masquerading as a, as a, as a leadership thing, which is, which is fundamentally a masculine quality. It's not that. It's not that women can't be leaders. It's that when women are leaders, they are, they are embodying a masculine spirit. So the, the, the competency crisis is something that's been sowed by the regime within its own walls. So now they're, they're like going to try to execute this, this complete takeover of the globe, and they're going to manage all these massively complex systems and fight a war on every possible front all at the same time and bankrupt their own currency and try to juggle all this debt. And all these things are massively complex. And yeah, then their their answer when people start to like rebel is, oh, we're just going to crash everything. Well, if they crash everything, they destroy their own power. So they can't just crash everything. They've got to try to keep things going while also keeping the the handbrake on. And they've destroyed all of their competency, their ability to do any of this. So the people who are the most familiar with this reality are the ones who have been the closest to the regime, the ones who have been in its inner halls, the ones who have had the deepest, most intimate experience with the managerial world. They recognize what it looks like when you don't have a strong executive, when you don't have strong leadership, when you don't have a healthy expression of the masculine spirit, which is cultivated by families and by having a homogenous society of people who are respectable and law-abiding. If you don't have that, you can't maintain a, a simple system, much less a complex one. And it just so happens that many of these people also have designs for you know, going to Mars. Like If, if you want to go to Mars, but you're getting your pay package unilaterally rescinded from you because of a judge who's o multiple times overruling the people who are employing you. It's like, how, do, how is this the thing that we're, we care about? Like on one hand, uh, climate change is an existential crisis and everyone in India is going to die in the next year because everything is so hot. But also we need to, we need to hone in on your, your, your compensation pack. This is evidence of the regime's coalition beginning to fracture. And there are the, the default position among the, the, the wealthy, like the moneyed class, which would include the political operatives and the media and the, the celebrities. And the, the thing that unites all of them is they want the cash cow to keep going. They want stability. They want economic growth. They want the United States to be a place where they can freely move around in the cities without worrying about getting shot or accidentally shooting up with, with a... a um, or are accidentally getting poisoned by some narcotic. Like they, they need to have this stability. They need to be able to maintain all of these, these trade networks in order to keep the cash cow going. But the people who've been in charge, 
are, there's no more adults in the room. The people who have been in charge are killing the, killing the golden goose. So within the mechanism that the regime used to prop itself up is becoming the seeds of its own downfall. So now this opens up the opportunity for prodigal son. And to get to the prodigal son, we have to get to this other point. So I, I, I mentioned this to Matt on a phone call yesterday. So we talked about the competency crisis. Mm, I've, been yes, talking yes. About this. I've been talking about this for years now. Um, what is intri- what's the, the meta, say, the bigger idea that's, that encompasses all these crises is a crisis of consequence. And this is, this is how you break liberal frame. One of, the, one of the reasons I started this podcast uh, was to break frame, my own and others. And I've said it repeatedly, that is my ultimate goal. I'm going to break your frame. And the reason why we need to break the frame of liberalism is not to cast out liberalism, is not to even to, to destroy it is you have to get your head out of it to see it and to see everything that has been encompassed by it and then start asking questions of what do we keep? What do we get rid of? What do we like? What do we don't like? What are the consequences of these actions? And to understand the consequence, this is what's happening now. And what's happening now, and I've said this uh, to you, Buck, before we start recording, is Anna Kasparian, in a weird way, of the Young Turks, is the canary in the coal mine. I don't expect everyone to know who that is. She's just, she's, she's ultra progressive. Of all the names you've mentioned today, those are probably the one. that's probably that's the one like, that people will know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. He names the most right. obscure right-wing names and he names her. I don't expect people to know who she is. <laughs> She's don't pretty, know who, Jason, know. and we all know I, who she is. I don't know who yeah. people know or don't, people don't know. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. But, but, but let's, let's put it this way, right? She, she's come out hard now against immigration, a whole bunch of other things. She's about as far right as a progressive as you're going to get. And why? Because she, she was accosted. This is going back a few months ago when we didn't, uh, I didn't ask Anna Kansarian, friend or fed, we can check that out. And it was right around the time she was accosted and, you know, probably in the vicinity of rape from some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, new culturalists, right? These, 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 these recent these, imports. Yeah. The yeah. white man, the white man's burdens. Right. Um, and she started reacting to it in the way that a reasonable human being would react to it. Right? saying, Hey, maybe we've gone too far. And you're seeing that with Bill Maher. You're seeing that across the board. This is part of the neo trads. What is my apple pie prediction? My apple pie, pie prediction is this. In very short order, when, when the woke is put away or is, is, is referred to as almost a joke, you will have the most extreme blue-haired, Bill Maher, people who have built their entire career on this wokeism, on this church of woke, like magic, turn around and be wearing nice little sundresses and frocks and, and, and selling apple pies. I guarantee it because it's happening. It's happening across the board. And the way that I made that prediction was I looked around and was like, what's going on? And I started seeing traditional neo-trad. I'm, I'm saying neo-trad with a Z, trads. So T-R-A-D-Z, right? Because it's going to happen with, with Gen Z the most. What was happening in, on Instagram? A whole bunch of cooking shows for women. Of women wearing sundresses and making apple pies. Then very complicated uh, and, and with headscarves and all the rest of it. Really leaning into it. That's your, that's, that's your edges. Right? That's, that's your the fringe. Most, that's your fringe, but the most acceptable fringe. And done in a mimetic fashion that everyone's going to start to, to, to correlate around. The elites are always looking to subvert that which is coming up from underground, from the edges. Mm. And also, often those edges are expressed to the lower class. What the, what the upper class or the elite does is redeem culture from the lower class. 
In the 1950s, what was the most elite thing to do? Go to black blues clubs, right? And get boogie woogie with a, you know, all that stuff. Mm. Produces Elvis. What is Elvis? Elvis is the redeemer of black culture in America. Right? 1960s. Again, built off the of blues, built off, built, built off the fringes of this underclass. It's redeemed through an elite class who says, no, 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 we're going to take this weird thing and make it cool. And but make then it, they ruin and, it. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, well then, I mean, from the, from, and that's I, what the neo-trads are doing. <laughs> yes, fair. Right. That, the neo-trads yeah. are the eagles, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Well, I'm not that. All right. You know, it's interesting, no. on, along with that, Jason, the, the, um, like the, 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 what do you think of the, the flower children of the, um, of like the sixties and the seventies, the, the, where it's all love, love and okay, peace but, and everything. But, but, this is, this is the, the fringe of the, so this is the, the fringe response to the martial center culture. And then the elites pulling that fringe in and taking it in as the, now we're all going to be love and fun and games and harmony. Here's yep. a better example, right? Cause, yep. cause I was, I was big into the beats and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. The beats became came before beatniks and the and that whole scene came before the the hippies. Now, what the, what the beatniks were way outside, right? We're talking nineteen forties, very dressed down society, very conservative. You read Bukowski, you read uh, 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 um, On the Road by by yeah, Kerouac, Jack Kerouac, all those guys, right? You read all those guys. That's the new fringe, right? Henry Miller. That's the absolute fringe and was i would i actually believe there's was the last true expression of great art in america in terms of in terms of it and and, and i'm not saying those guys are our guys but in terms of true great subversive art because along with along with those guys was uh was william faulkner mm-hmm. and he was a generation before but but sound the fury all that stuff laid the groundwork to the hippies but the hippies and that whole movement was the neo trads of their day, was their way of, of mushing everything into the middle. So you take the most extreme parts of like that cult, counterculture, drop in, drop out, you know, like electric Kool Aid acid test. That Tom Wolf, that whole that, that whole scene is a way of normalizing, and that's what we're going to start seeing. You're going to start seeing a, a massive normalizing of right wing, far right. Right, blah blah blah, uh, 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 culture to the point where it's going to get really freaking annoying because you're going to start seeing all these blue haired people who are literally yesterday ultra regressive, pussy hat wearing, yada yada people. Now your abortion, right? Now, now tisking you for not doing the doing a cross correctly at, at, at dinner or reciting Bible verse to you <laughs> in a very annoying way, Got or it. talking about Yarvin as if. As if they as as if as if this is like a where were you? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, it's happening, it's gonna happen, it's gonna get more annoying, but there's an opportunity here for us to seize upon, which if you're black pilled, you don't see, but if you're but if you're you know bitter white pilled like myself, this is this is a fantastic event. Sure. Is, is the reason I'm starting to put some of this together is the reason that you think people like the three of us will be still seen as somewhat of a rival or an enemy, if you will, or something like that, because this is still a bit of a false pop culture version of something that's taking what we have. Not, I'm not trying to sound vain or something, but like if you're, if you're orthodox, this is still not going to be that. It's just a reaction to the other thing. Buck, how many attacks you've seen on the Orthodox Church? How many people have been right. con- contacted you to, to attack you on the Orthodox Church? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm telling you this. This is this is a very sincere prediction for anyone who listens to this. Anyone who is Orthodox will come in, in, into firing line, and our and our job is to hold the line. Yeah, because because our job here is Orthodox. So right now. And we've talked, Father Turbo's talked about this. You've talked about this on your show, Buck, multiple times. Right now, there's an alignment of, let's say, dissonant right or far right politics and the Orthodox. We all have the same, we, we all identify the same problems. Mm. 
the issue, the, the thing is that in, in orthodoxy, we're not giving you solutions like political solutions. It's not about that. It's about healing yourself so you understand what the pitfalls are and identifying the passions and trying to bring death to the world. Death to the world t-shirt. Death to the passions. This is requiring a sacrifice and requiring a, uh, a redemption that you can't find in an ideology. You're not going to find in the political movement. This is the, so I'll, I'll make this as my, uh, my, my way to get to the prodigal son. Uh, I'll read it something out, right? This is the parable of the prodigal son. And this is how it relates to the vengeful son. This is, this is what I think this group, the three of us, along with Tommy Sammons, Adam Patrick, uh, and a few others, uh, we're in this circle. And this is, this is something that I think, and this is not just because I'm coming up with it, but I think this is how we, we counteract it, the whole thing. And this is what we need to start modeling. We model this successfully. We, we reinvert this inverted world. We get things back on track, which people want. The, the whole point of the neo trads is this. I'll say this before I get to the parable of the, of the, of the prodigal son. What people are, are projecting, what I'm, what I'm reading, is that people want redemption. The desire is for de- redemption. You're seeing this with the uh, 2022 people, right? Who leaned into that whole 20, 2020 stuff. They want forgiveness. There's whole articles written about how forgiveness, amnesty should be given. For people who we didn't know, could have known, okay? People want forgiveness. They want a redemptive force for these consequences that they have bought into. And that desire is very strong. That's why they will go to the neotrads. This is why a lot of leftists will veer right. Because yeah. it will be like this whole like, you know, they're I, still I skipping the sacrifice part of it. Obviously, is what you're getting at. I, I think. Well, it, so I've I've created a trinity with a trinity idea with it, which is it's 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 return to the Father, to to repent and then be redeemed. And in an Orthodox understanding of this, this is what we do every morning. We wake up. We do morning prayers. We return to the Father. We repent of our sins, both past, present, and future. And we are redeemed. The Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon, have mercy upon me, a sin. Right? That's this trinity. Return, repent, redeem. Return, repent, redeem. The ritual and reality are one. Right? Keep that in mind. This is the prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son. I'm reading this from, uh, from the first thing I pulled up. So, don't at me. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the well-known parable of the prodigal son. A son who asks his father for his inheritance, then squanders it recklessly as he lives a life of indulgence. With nothing left of his fortune, he is forced to work as a hired hand as for a pig farmer. He is so destitute that he longs to eat the food of the pigs. Realizing that his father's servants have, been, have better working conditions, he resolves to return to the father, beg forgiveness, ask to be his servant. However, upon arriving at his father's house, he's welcomed with loving arms. His father is overwhelmed with joy at his son's return and holds a feast in his honor. So he got up and went back to his father while he was still a long way off. His father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants quickly Bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring upon his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fat and take a fat take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was was dead, has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration begins. This is Luke 15, 20, 24. Uh, and one last point of this. However, the prodigal son's older brother was who had been, who has remained serving in his father's house does not share his father's joy. His city is jealous that his father has not honored him. His father urges him not to resent his brother, but instead be happy for him. Now, this is a cure to the vengeful son. The vengeful son is the shadow of the prodigal son. 
what is the thing that holds this little group together? You, me, Matt, Tommy Sammons, Adam Patrick. We can add more to the list. Uh, uh, Peter Kunonis. We all left mm-hmm. in our pride, in our vainglory. We squandered our inheritance. We denied God. We denied the Father. And all of us has come back to the Father in repentance, in humility. We've been redeemed by the Father. And we are in a constant state of redemption. Sorry if I get emotional. Uh, we are in this constant state of redemption. This is not a one and done. Right. This isn't your, your, your you know, right. evangelical baptism. This is continuous. Every morning we wake up, we return to the Father, we, we, we repent, we redeem. Right? Our calling as the prodigal son, is to be redeemed by the father. And in doing so, we redeem our dads. So the calling and the counterbalance to the vengeful son, instead of being resentful to the deception and the, uh, to the generational uh, problems of the, of, the, of the 19th and 20th century, instead of laying blame and bring it down, we redeem it. Redeem our dads, redeem the boomers by doing that which they did not do. When I came to this idea, this realization, my natural born father divorced my mother when I was about one years old, right? I saw John maybe one or two, you know, a couple times a year up until I was about 21, and then we just stopped talking. In the first year of my daughter's life, because of COVID, especially, and I had a hand injury and a whole bunch of stuff. I spent every single day with my, with my daughter up until like this, really in the last year, I've spent every single day with my daughter. I spent more time in my daughter's life in one year than my father, my natural born father did in my entire life. I just redeemed my dad. The way I'd redeem my dad was that he is necessary for me to exist. And, and when I do things that he did not do or could not do, for whatever reasons, without any resentment or animosity, I just redeemed him. Without him, I could not be. And without me, my daughter could not be. So I exist in my daughter. And, my, and, and all the elements that make up me rest in my daughter. And I am the selector. I am the filter. I am the chooser of what, well, hopefully, anyways, what will be represented in my daughter and will be carried forth. So my grandfather, the guy behind me, he was my, my surrogate father. He's a guy I look like who uh, I reference all the time. That's why I wear, don't wear shorts. <laughs> to lighten the mood a little bit. But he lives on in me. He's my model. I model my grandfather. I have taken my grandfather's model I add on to it. I then represent that to my daughter. I am the model to my daughter. I will live on my daughter. And, on, and so on and so on and so on. Until no one knows my name, but my effects and who I am will be felt through future generations. This is immortality. To the secularist. Do you want to believe in mystical heaven? Fine. Understand the, the lineage. You will last forever in your lineage. This is the power of it. This is why we have this beautiful moment in time. Prodigal son, by modeling prodigal son, turn to the father in humility. Turn, repent, redeem. Rinse and repeat. This is your, re- this is your, rit- this is your ritual. Ritual and the reality are one. This is how we redeem the boomers. This is how we move forward. This is how we flip this invert world back to something that is back into Christendom. Sorry. Well put. Don't be sorry about that. That was great. Matt, uh, in closing, you follow that up. I, I would say <laughs> if you can, but you're Matt. You, you Fuck always you, Matt. Have... <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that uh, obviously like wholehearted stamp of approval to everything that Jason said. And to add on to it, I'll say that uh, we're guaranteed to fail. We're absolutely going to fail. This is not the end of history. We're going to fail. And our generations 
will be will be forced to redeem us. Our future generations will be forced to redeem us. So, so the best we can do is the best we can do. The direction is what matters. The trajectory is what matters. We'll fall short. Fortunately, our Father has redeemed us. And so then through that redemption and through us striving toward that redemption, we will give an opportunity, the best opportunity we could possibly give to our future dis- our descendants to have the same chance to redeem us in our failings. And the best we can do is, you know, the, this, this, this biblical concept of the, the, the generational curses and generational blessings that they, uh, they descend three generations. And, and it's almost like, it, it's like you, 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 I think this gets at one of these like social cycles that repeats over and over and over again throughout history. It's like the, it's almost, you could think of like the, the human species itself is breathing and there's a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall. And it just continues. It could be 5,000 years from now and we could be long ancient history, long forgotten. And these same cycles will keep, will will continue because this is something that's, is fundamental to the human experience in this life right now. But there's something, there's something about like three generations that you, it's like you've you finally outlived the lifespan of the the third generation back. So they've now left um, current memory. Like once the boomers have died and moved on, their their memory is going to be redeemed naturally. Yes. There won't be the same hostility toward them anymore. Right. It's gonna it's gonna they're gonna be remembered with fondness. People will love all the boomerisms. It'll be it'll become a thing of affection. It's something about them needing to move on, and then it'll be the same with us. These, these are social, these are human social cycles that just continue. And our job is to play our, is to do our, our job within them, is to play our role, recognize, recognize reality, where we are with respect to God, where we are with respect to our fellow man, and play the role that we've been given. We, did, we made the libertarian uh, world uh, hue and cry several years ago talking about this, but uh, you don't have rights. You have responsibilities. Yes. There's a responsibility inherent to your existence. When you were born, you were born into a network of relationships and obligations that you are beholden to. You have an obligation to uphold and respect and exist within that context. And then to pass on that opportunity to your own children. You get to the point where you have your own family, you have your own children, and your, your children have their own children. And you, you I've, as I've become known to say, you, we have to build the trees of the future generations. Um, I meant plant the trees. It came out, build the trees, and I just just roll with it. But um, so yeah, so there's. I think this is what 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 Jason has termed a bitter white pill, which is that we will fail. We it's it is guaranteed, is foretold that we will fail, and we will continue failing, and the future generations will continue failing. But at the same time, there is going there is an upward trajectory to this to this failure. We're going to continue failing up because we know the end of the story. We know that. As as good friend of of all of our shows, David Gornoski says, the 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 scriptures start in a garden and they end in a city. And there's something really profound about the city of God. If you understand like the what what the city was typologically to the authors of the Bible, the, probably the only thing that would be equivalent to it would be like Sodom today. If you if people the way people will metaphorically use like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what the cities stood for. So to say the city of God would have struck an, an ancient mind like, like you're saying, this is God's Sodom. Because the cities have found all the, all the corruption and perversion and everything that they were associated with. But the other thing a city is, is it's technology. There's, you start in the garden, and then the human experience is this, is this development and growth through technological cycles. Technology is this, this natural outworking of human interactions, human behavior, that reflects humanity back to itself. Technology is apocalyptic by, by its own nature. And it's not possible to be human without developing and using technology. To be Christian is not to be a Luddite. Our job is not to war with technology. Our job is to redeem technology. Because we know that the ultimate technology, the city, heaven is a city. Heaven is a redeemed technology. So we can't, we can't shy away from these responsibilities. We have to move out into them. I like to say that the Christianity was the original were the Christians were the original colonizers. Our responsibility is to go out and colonize the world. To whether it's science or uh, medicine or uh, uh, technological innovation, politics, all these different things, we need to go colonize them ourselves. We redeem them. We take the pagan shrine and we build a church on top of it. 
And this applies in a literal sense and in a metaphorical sense. We need to take these pagan shrines and we need to build our church on top of them, which is an act of sacrifice and devotion. And, and, and a, it's the, the civilization building activities, as Jason has referred to them. Yeah, well put. Just for fun, as we close this, those were all, I mean, we got pretty deep. I love it. And um, quick predictions. November, let's say the day, let, let's say three days after the election. What are we witnessing, Matt? I think we're going to be witnessing a um, hmm. I think we're going to be witnessing a a, a large battle over um, poll watchers, and the you're seeing Laura Trump, the the co chair of the RNC, now talking about all of the lawyers and all of the poll watchers and stuff that they're they're rallying together. This is not your this is not your father's GOP. It's a very different GOP now. Um, oh. It's taking time for that to to reflect down through all the different apparatuses of the GOP. But it's very clear that something has changed significantly at the top and they're actually looking at this. And now there's many more significant economic, financial, uh, political, cultural, social forces that are all bearing down on this. It's becoming pretty common knowledge to talk about these you know, elections being fake or whatever. Yes. And there's, there's so much vested interest in the at least the illusion of elections being sustained that I don't think that the system has it in itself to completely torch that. Okay. So I suspect that there's going to be a legal battle. There's going to be a fight, but that fight is ultimately going to be stood down. Yeah. I, I don't think they have got the, I just don't think they can do the, what well, we're shutting down at midnight in this state and this state and where it's so, I mean, it was obvious enough last time, but it was obvious to, I, I think kind of a fringe or a, a, a minority of people. I don't think they can do that again. Jason. I'll, I'll, real quick. I'll throw yeah. this in there as well. What was when we had the article that was written by, by time about yes. how the election was fortified. Yes. If you remember who was a very significant figure in the fortification of the election donated $400 million toward that cause. Peter Thiel, if I was remember. Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Oh, who was who? close with Peter Thiel. Yes. Peter yes, Thiel that's... is Mark Zuckerberg's mentor. Yeah. Interesting. Jason. Yeah. I think, have you noticed how quiet it is? Politically, it's quiet. They've had, they've had to bring out, you know, celebrities from 2005. Yeah, right. To try to sell by who I hated to begin with, <laughs> right? Yeah. Jack Black and my friends that are close to me know. Yeah, he, he's he's looking like ne he's looking never like, understood that, that phenomenon. Who was that comedian who like uh, took a sledgehammer to to watermelons Gallagher? Yeah. Uh, so you have Jack Black looking like Gallagher out <laughs> trying to promote this guy that everyone's starting to understand has is 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 literally shooting the bed. Yes, um, but it makes sense so, because Jack Black was a was a farcical. Um, meme of a musician, right? Like, right. like Joe Biden is of a president of sorts. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's heavy negotiations happening there, which is why it's so quiet. Uh, I mean, look at you, you've got, you got crazy things, right? Michigan of things. Uh, you got Donald Trump potentially going to jail on federal crimes, uh, who might be running a uh, presidential campaign for, literally from behind bars. You have a president, a sitting president, who is literally out of his mind. Uh, it's undeniable now. Like liberal press is is discussing this. It's it's out there. It's it's not just us talking about this. It's on MSNBC. It's on like it's on all, all the big stations. I think there's negotiations happening behind the scenes, and like negotiations are essentially what Yarvin was put forward is like here's your, your here's your golden parachute. This is why. This is my preferred outcome. This is my bias. Is that they're offering the current regime a way out. Because as they paint themselves, this is the crisis of consequences. Is that you've painted yourself in this corner and now all these predictions, all these things that you thought were going to happen aren't happening. In fact, they're blowing your faces. This is, uh, Russia won the war in Ukraine the moment they, they sidestepped and did a parallel economy to, these, to the sanctions. That was supposed to be the kill shot and didn't work. Mm. And everything else is blowing up their faces to the point where now, if you offer them a nice little parachute, I think they'll take it. 
And it's just a negotiation of how this will happen so that, you know, you're going to protect them from the vengeful son. Because if this, if that doesn't happen, and I'm being careful because I know you're on different things. Yeah. So I'm very, Thank just you. being careful. I, I'm being careful for myself too, because I don't want anyone attaching myself to this, to, to, to what I think was going to happen. Put it this way. If they let Trump in and, and the people behind him, things will, will, will get nasty and weird, but it'll be a bit more controlled. If they don't, prepare for the worst. Because I think if they reinstall Biden and those people, you're going to see violence in the West unlike anything you've, you have been conditioned to, to accept. It will be totalizing. It will be in every facet of your life. Because people are going to reject it. Mm-hmm. And this thing's going down. This, thing's, this thing is being transformed one way or the other. And hopefully it's by, by, by smart, controlled people who are, going to, who are going to guide this. If they lose out and it becomes the other group, God help us all. Um, because it, it, gets, it gets bad mm-hmm. um, real fast. And I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing incidents about this all the time. My feed is just dominated. By vigilante justice happening in America and France and Europe, all the places. You want to see that happening? Your six degrees of separation will be will be down to two, mm-hmm. where it's happening in your town, in your life, by your neighbors. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it's going to get bad. And there's so, a lot of guys who talk a big game about how, like, oh yeah, that's what we need. You know, we need to have the consequences. Have them. I want to see him hanging from the overpass. No, you're an idiot. You I don't know. want to live in that world. Right. Because that you, you don't just like, you know, have a little bit of that for a treat. You don't just dip your toe in those waters and then, okay, we're done now. Let's pull out of it. No, like once you unlock the, the, the thirst for blood, then it, it will progress very, very far before it's quenched. There will be, the, we, would, we would be rebuilding out of that for a century. Yes. Maybe more. Yep. It's going to be, that would be absolutely catastrophic. I don't care how yep. gratifying it sounds. I don't care how much it would get your jollies off. You've got yep. to pull your head out of your ass because that, yeah. that can't fly. If you're it's saying gonna, that you've never everybody. been punched in the face, if you're saying yeah. that, that that's, a, that's a very sheltered mentality. Because it's, it's getting punched, punched in, the in the face on a massive level that you can't even comprehend. It's being pulled out into the street and shot. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And at first you go, Ah, they're doing it to the right people. Right. Yeah. Right? Right. Until it comes down to, oh, they're doing it to my family. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're doing it to, you know, my, my cousin who's gay. Yeah. Oh, they're doing it to uh, someone who voted liberal. My wife, right? because she has a criminal record. They're not, not white enough. Not this enough. Not that enough. Oh, you got too much of this, too much of that. You, you know, you, oh, you kissed a wall once. Like, this is, and, and, and I'm making light of it, but this is the spiral you get into. And this is, the, it's, this is the, tr- the troubling spiral is that it's going to feel good. And the more it feels good, you, the more you lean into it. And the more you think it's justified, it's righteous, and you, tr- you start turning blind eyes. It's what the left did, right? Do you think the majority of people on the left really, really want their kids to be, to be neutered? No. Or you want to want to go to the gay pride parades and all this? No. They know it's wrong. It's part of sin. The whole point of sin is you know it's wrong. You can't sin if you're if you're if you're ignorant. You 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 sin because you know it's wrong, and yet you're still doing it, <laughs> right? And you say eh, because you think ah, greater good, yada yada yada, right? Uh, God doesn't exist. Uh, all these like, yeah, you know it's wrong. And the more you you tune into it, the more it gets worse. And it's not, and so base world is just, is just the more perverted version of Ancapistan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's why prodigal son, my friend, we, mm-hmm. and this is why, you know, uh, this little group we have, and I'm very honored and humbled to be part of, um, I'm just saying I'm part of it. I, mean, <laughs> it's, I don't know if there's a vote, but, uh, actually I'll end with this. 
I am, I've said this before, I will say this again. I'll say this, I know it's in this day and age, it's not, it's, it's always suspicious, but I am incredibly humbled uh, to be part of these conversations, to be, to be talking to you guys, man. It's keeping me sane. Uh, because without it, I'd be just yelling at sand. <laughs> 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 I'd be yelling at the beach. Yeah. And, you and they'd the lock beach. me up. Yeah. <laughs> and who knows what, right? I, it, all of these kind of conversations, I think, in our little group and how our groups interact with others gives me a lot of hope for the future, gives me a lot of hope for my child, gives me a lot of hope for everything. And it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's good, man. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm very humbled uh, to be part of these conversations. So I thank you boys for, uh, for letting me in. I agree. I agree. I'm humbled as well. I'm glad you guys were both on here. Now you get speaking of these conversations, a lot of them go on. I'm part of Matt's discord group. I'm, I'm more of a silent lurker because I'm, I'm, I'm busy, <laughs> but that is not an excuse for you guys not to be part of it. So Matt, you plug away anything you'd like, and then Jason will get to you to plug as well. Yeah, uh, the YouTube channel. Um, I once again every Monday to Friday about ten AM Central. I do the the Astrolabe. We have a lot of fun with that, and uh, and then we're doing we've got some interviews coming up uh, with some interesting folks. And then Cooper and I are still doing our King Pilled streams every so often. We just did one talking about Tucker Carlson and his uh, conversation with Naive Bukele, which is yes profound. He is he is a true statesman. He's the first real state statesman that I've really seen in my life, um, and probably further back than that. Um, the YouTube stream on the on the thing got messed up because I was streaming someone else's content. I'm going to see if I can get it uploaded. It's on Twitter. If you go to at Real King Pilled, you can watch it on Twitter there, or it'll be on the podcatchers probably by the time this one comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the King Pilled Discord. I appreciate you shouting it out. Kingpilled.com. We've got a great group of pe people in there. There's some about a hundred guys, I think. Actually, there's some women in there as well. And, <laughs> Whoa, uh, that's easy now. <laughs> yeah, right. I think there's like four, maybe four Alleged. or five. Alleged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got Cooper as well. So you know, like yeah. that blurs the lines. He took my um, joke. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, we have a great time in there, and we're actually starting a new, a new, uh, a new bit that will be happening on a weekly basis as often as we can. We're going to do some schizo streams where uh, just for people in the Discord, anyone who signs up, uh, you can join. It, the way I'm kind of visualizing it is like if I was to go over to Buck's house and we were to have a have a, an evening where a group of a dozen or twenty or thirty or however many guys just went over there and sat down and watched something about I don't know ancient aliens or cryptids or. Uh, the pyramids or you know, anti-gravitic technology, UFOs, all these sorts of things, all these fascinating schizo things is water conscious, these sorts of, of, of videos. Um, basically doing that except digitally. So we just, we'll just stream something on the, on the Discord and anybody who wants to can come hang out and watch along and we'll pause it and chat and such things. So anyways, kingpill.com, that'll take you there. Love it. And uh, you don't have to say what it was, but just for Cooper, just to, I hope he sees this and he can smile. His, his screen name today was the closest I've ever felt in relationship with Cooper. Uh, Jason, go ahead, buddy. You plug away. Tube Podcast, the name of the channel. Uh, I am Jason Marinchuk, the host, creator, content provider, yada, yada, yada. We have two main shows on a weekly basis at the end of the day the interview show and uh, meet the base which is the uh, which is the panel show and of course we still do friends or feds or we will do friends or feds at some point again in the future on youtube spotify rumble x all the places uh go check us out uh two-bit podcast is the name of the channel jason marinchuk is the name of the host that's me and uh, again thank you so much buck for inviting us on Awesome. Matt, Jason, thank you guys. Thank you. What a show. I love chatting with both of these guys. Like I mentioned up top, I could sit in a bar with them, have a beer or two or whatever we want to have and talk about this stuff for hours. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. As for this show, counterflowpodcast.com. Follow me on Twitter at BuckRebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Join the Telegram group. It's always going strong. SouthernOrthodox.org to attend the conference we've got here in Lockhart coming up September 6th through 9th, I believe is the uh, weekend. Whatever that weekend is in September, we are hosting the Philip Ludwell III Conference. Part two, the second annual conference is going to be here in Lockhart. Next week, we have 
a deeply spiritual, dark, yet light podcast. It's going to be a good show. You guys have a great week. Thank you. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.